Hi, everyone, and welcome to Flock Talk. I'm Robin Sullivan from the Leather Elves, and I'm here with Jack Pine. How's it going, Jack? Doing pretty good, Robin. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. It's 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 not snowing. Awesome. So, positive. Um, got my second vaccine today. Oh, very nice. So I have been Pfizerized. <laughs> <laughs> oh. but, um, you know, and and I, I was I'm feeling okay. So I'm glad that we could be here tonight. We've got kind of an interesting topic and we've got a guest that we'll be bringing on in a little bit. Um, we wanted to talk to you guys about making the connection. So very few pets have a direct connection um, to a wild species and we're lucky enough that parrots do. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And so Jack, I know I'm going to turn it over to you. What are our announcements for this week? All right, so these are going to be the same things pretty much that we always uh, want to point out. So first of all, if you guys are just now joining us for the very first time, um, welcome. Uh, but we want to make sure that you like the Leather Elves page on Facebook. That way you will get notifications whenever we do one of these live streams. We do them every, every Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern. But... Uh, you know, if you like the Leather Elves on Facebook, you'll make sure you don't miss out on any of those videos. Uh, if you go to the High Redbird YouTube page, we take all of these videos, we put those up over there as well. So you guys can participate with that there. You can participate with it on the High Redbird page on Facebook. Uh, of course, the Leather Elves and High Redbird both have an Instagram page that you want to follow as well. Um, we are going to pretend that nobody can notice that I look a little tired. My voice is kind of giving out. Uh, I have been hand raising a baby goat. Um, so it is exhausting. Um, but if you go to our Instagram pages, I share things like pictures of a baby goat. So um, who doesn't need that in their life? Um, but th those are a couple general things that we want to make sure that you guys know about, because we don't want you to miss out on any of the things that we're doing. We also did want to remind you that we are continuing our 50 viewer challenge. Now that means 50 viewers at any one time during the live stream. We have far exceeded 50 viewers total, um, but at one time, 50 viewers at any one time, we will be giving away a t-shirt from the High Redbird Threadless store. Um, and if you guys don't want to wait, you can, of course, just visit the High Redbird Threadless store, pick out any of those fun shirts that you would like to wear. Um, I love to wear my shirt that says, sorry, I'm late. I have birds because then I don't have to explain myself. Um, so it's very, very useful. Um, and we did also want to point out that Robin and I are going to be putting together something very, very exciting in a little over a month, we are going to be having the first ever Place Your Bets conference. This is a avian conference focused on behavior enrichment training and science. We are going to have speakers from all over the world. We are going to have uh, hands-on workshops with materials that we will provide for you guys as well. Um, it is going to be a ton of fun. There will be a virtual happy hour. So if you have missed hanging out, with your avian friends. This would be a great opportunity to do that as well. So not only should you register, you can scan any of the QR codes you see on the screen. Um, we are putting up the information for it on both the High Redbird and the Leather Elves Facebook pages. Uh, but you should get your friends to come with you too, because y'all can all have a lot of fun together. You can talk about us behind our back in the chat. Um, but we're also, just so everyone knows, we're as we always do, we're doing a giveaway tonight um, with our trivia question. And the giveaway tonight will be tied into the Place Your Bets conference. So lots of fun stuff going on. But we do have a guest tonight, so I want to get right to it. Um, our guest tonight is Daniel Sigmund. Uh, I was able to meet, lucky enough to meet Danny at... Um, NPRPF. Hi, Danny. Welcome. Hey, guys. How are you? 
I am very good. Thank you. All the more for being here with you guys. We love Danny. We have more fun with Danny and it's, and Danny's got such a gentle, wonderful wisdom about him. And that's why Jack and I wanted to have you on Danny is because you've got this great information that really needs to be shared with people. So um, Jack, I know Jack's known Danny even longer. Do you have anything fabulous to say about Danny? He's all right. I don't know if I, I think I've known you longer than I've known Jack, Robin. Have or you just, really? Uh, I oh. think so. Yeah. Yeah. Jack I was win. too fabulous <laughs> when I first met him to, to have anything to do with me. So. Oh, well, I'm glad we got that all taken care of. So, all right. The Mutual Admiration Society's done. Let's talk about conservation. Um, so, you know, Danny, first of all, I do, I want people who are listening who haven't had the opportunity to meet you um, to to know where this passion comes from. Um, so I um, I have always well, as far as conservation in general, I've always been kind of uh, a, a person that's in awe of nature. But I got a um, sun conure uh, just about fourteen years ago. Um, and I'm a committed nerd. And so I learned everything I possibly could about, about her and, uh, and then about other birds, uh, that, uh, particularly, um, the, the, uh, the Carolina parakeet, which was America's parrot, which most people don't even know about anymore. Um, and, um, learned about how it disappeared and the role that we played in, in both making that happen and how the role we played in not, not making it happen. Uh, and, um, it's just turned into a little bit of an obsession. And, um, I think that, uh, a little bit, yeah, just a little bit. And, um, <laughs> it, it made me think about what I could do, and what my part in that story, that continuing story, uh, is. So, and I, I think Danny brings up a great point right out of the gate. Danny, you know, calls himself a nerd, but the really cool thing is Danny did his homework. Danny knew, found out about the Sun Conyers as he was getting that bird. It wasn't just I'm going to jump in this and get it done. It was there was some research involved. So as a matter of fact, uh, this is one of my favorite stories. I'm sure you've heard me say it, but um, I had been thinking it took me, it took me a long time to get a parrot. I had been thinking about getting a parrot um, for a decade. And one day I woke up and because what you read, you know, I thought, Ooh, I'd like to get a parrot. And what a lot of what you read is don't get a parrot they're very high maintenance. They take so much commitment. Don't do it on a whim. It's, it's so hard. It's, it's, they're the worst pets ever. It's, it's evil to get one. And, um, and so I thought, well, let me think about it. And then 10 years later, I said, you know, a decade by any definition is not impulsive. So I'm going to go ahead and do it. So, yeah. I did a lot of research before I got my bird. <laughs> yeah. well, just, just a little... Go ahead, Dan, Jack. Well, I was going to say, I, so I, Danny, I know you just called yourself a nerd, um, but I believe the technical term that you use for nerd um, is avian science communicator. Uh, 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 yes. I mean, so, cause here's the, so, you know, I've, I've spoken at, um, at quite a number of conferences and, and, and events. And, um, <laughs> I'm not, a, but, and, and, and as a matter of fact, people, you know, they, they, they treat me as this sort of learned person or whatever. And I'm just like a regular Joe. I mean, I, I'm a composer. That's what, that's what I'm trained to do. I'm not, um, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not a scientist. I'm, I don't have a degree in birds. Um, but, I have been able to, to learn a lot of stuff and, um, 
I think other people can can make the same contribution as I have. Um, and um, so anyway, um, uh, anyway, so as, as, as Jack was looking for a term for me uh, at this other event that I spoke at, he's like, well, what, do, what is your title? And I thought, well, I'm not a scientist. I'm not really, if you say researcher, somebody, they eventually say, okay, lab coats and, you know, like, you know, microscopes and stuff. And I'm not really that either. And I don't want to, um, I don't want to assume that I deserve the same mantle of awe as someone who's gone and gotten their PhD in something. So how about science communicator? I'm like one of those guys on YouTube that, that talks about cool science things, but is just a guy. So that that's me. So avian science communicator. Oh. So I think we should we should get into the meat of things here and see if see what the audience thinks, Danny. We'll see if by the end of this evening, our audience on Flock Talk here on Friday nights thinks you're just a guy. Because I think what? we're going to find that they're pretty impressed with this guy that we're having on. <laughs> you know, uh, AFA, when I did my first speech, they introduced me as Dr. Daniel Sigmund. And I was quick to say, oh, no. No, not Dr. <laughs> Daniel. But so when other people ask me, oh, where did you get your doctorate? I say, oh, AFA. So, yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, but I, I think with that, the other good thing to point out is Danny comes at this from this mentality of he is just a guy. And there are still things that he can do to help educate people, things that he can do to help promote species in the wild. So it really drives home that this is something that everyone can do. Um, so I certainly hope by the end of this session, everybody watching is going to be inspired. Um, you know, we've come up with some things that we think would be really, really helpful. So, yeah. So we'll, we'll find out, like Diane said, he's going to turn out to be a rocket surgeon. Nice. Okay. <laughs> so, so Danny, we know, so you've got a son, Conyer. I'd so other, what's yes. the connection, right, well, yes. So what's the connection we can make between your son, Conyer, and what's going on with son Conyers out there in the bigger world? So um, uh, let's start with, um, let's, before we get to the son Conyer, let's start with the Carolina parakeet. Uh, because okay. the, car because the, which is actually the, um, we know now through scientific uh, research, through genetic studies, that the Carolina parakeet is basically the closest living relative to the Carolina parakeet. Um, it's, so, yeah. And that, go ahead. Yes. The sun conure. Did I say the, the Carolina closest, parakeet? Sorry. Is yes, the closest the sun, living relative of the Carolina not the, yeah, parakeet. The, yes, we know that the Carolina parakeet is the closest relative of the Carolina parakeet. Uh, yeah, the sun conure is the closest living relative of the Carolina parakeet. So um, I have a slide um, of a Carolina parakeet, a very famous uh, Carolina parakeet among Carolina parakeet people, um, if you want to put that up right quick. Um, this is a picture of uh, a, oh, nope, not that one. It's the one with Paul Barch. There we go. There we go. Um, that is Paul Barch, and that is Doodles. Um, Doodles was a Carolina parakeet that was gifted to him by uh, a conservationist uh, and Carolina parakeet enthusiast back at the um, turn of the last century. And um, she was a typical pet bird, um, just like you would have with us. As a matter of fact, they, they made really good pets, uh, Carolina parakeets. And um, yeah, Robert Ridgway. So this bird was captive bred um, by Robert Ridgway and then given to Paul Barch. And um, Paul uh, had has this tragic journal entry uh, that he talks about where he where he talks about his Carolina parakeet and all these, you know, he has a few stories of this happened and this happened and all these other things, which I'm sure um, you would not want to hear about. And then he goes on. 
And that's the last we hear. And I, of course, read that and just, you know, cringed and, ah, because I do want to know all those stories. And I wish he, or wish he had written them down and had shared them with us. And so we lost all of this wonderful information that we can't get because the Carolina parakeet is, um, is gone. And um, so it made me reflect on my own bird keeping and, and, uh, and whatnot. And um, we, it's also important to note that the Carolina parakeet did not have to go extinct because it bred really well in aviculture in, 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 uh, in captivity. And had we just known what we were doing at the time, um, the, they could have been kept alive for nothing else, the pet trade. Um, and I think that's where I come at it is that the, for us, we as pet keepers provide a, an incentive to keep these guys around uh, in, a, in, a, in a universe that is shrinking for these guys uh, because there are more people and there's less forest and there's less habitat. And so we've got to come up with another way to, to provide incentive for us to help keep them around. So, um, but the Sun Conure, if you put up the, the, the Sun Conure slide, just want something that's really interesting. And the reason I think that this, this um, parallels the Carolina parakeet um, is that the Carolina parakeet was thought of as synonymous all over the place. Uh, it's just like, there was just too many of them to ever be a worry. And I think people thought the same thing, uh, but it, until recently we discovered that the sun conure um i don't have a pointer but you can see the the red bits over there that's part of their classic historical range that goes into guyana they're almost extinct in guyana and as a matter of fact we think there may be as little as a thousand birds left in captivity i mean in 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 uh in nature and in, in the wild in the natural habitat um but in captivity, there are gazillions of sun conures. Um, so, but this is the only place in the wild that sun conures live. And if something is not done, um, we could lose them in the wild. But there is, even if that was to happen, the species is still here because of aviculture. And and us wanting uh, sun conures as pets. Um, so go ahead, go ahead, Robin. No, I, I think Jack had a comment. That's a really oh, okay. important point to bring up because I think a lot of people see the birds that we have in captivity. They see that you can get some birds as pets, and they don't realize the state of these birds in the wild. Um, I think it's important to point out that according to the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, more than half of all parrot species are known to have a declining population, and about a third are listed by the IUCN as threatened or worse, so uh, perhaps endangered um, or extinct in the wild. So um, I think it's really important for people to know that even if we have them in captivity, if you're seeing them in captivity, what their life is like in their natural range may be a different story altogether. Well, and, and, and you, you go ahead, go ahead, Robin. Yeah. And I was just going to say that, you know, I've had people say to me, oh, I just have a son Conyer. I don't have one of those big macaws or I don't have, you know, one, any of those big birds that are endangered. And the sun conure isn't technically endangered at this point, but people need to be aware that they've got to bring the message to people how important they are and how important that conservation piece is. And we're responsible. We've got these animals in our care. Now we need to make people appreciate them. We need to show them what it is that makes us love these birds so much and why we need to conserve them. And, you know, through things like, captive breeding through, you know, habitat uh, protection. And we need to think about those kind of things. And it's not just a sun conure. Right. No, it's not just a sun conure. They're, they are rich and, and marvelous organisms. And uh, we have actually done them a great service 
uh, by keeping them as pets. Now, let me let me let me go into one thing that can be a little bit of a uh, it, where there's a sort of a counterindication, if you will, in some places. So, you, people, one thing that people that are against the keeping of pet birds um, will go to is that they will blame the pet trade for the decline in the population. Now, that is true to an extent because in their native range, what happens is people will go and get um babies from nests and will hand raise them and that causes a problem here in the united states though in places where these animals are not native um it, it here since 1992 i believe was passage of the uh wild bird conservation act and it has been illegal to to bring in um wild caught birds for any purpose other than strictly controlled uh, uh, conservation efforts and and one you need heavy permits from the government to do that um, so every bird well I'm not gonna say every because there are always people that do nef nefarious things but for the most part any bird that you buy here in the United States was bred here um, mm -hmm. and th so we we're not so even though that the keeping of pet birds may be a problem in their native range. We're not doing that. As a matter of fact, we're keeping that species alive because we, because even if they decline completely in their native range, we have all of these other specimens from around the world. And I think too, Danny, that brings up the point that by breeding in captivity, um, one of the things we're doing is, decreasing so you you're not supposed to bring them in that's the law that's the rule but as you said there are people that do these things these nefarious things but there's no need for the poaching there is no need for that to happen if we have them available here through responsible captive breeding yeah and so absolutely. you know adrian, adrian mentioned at one point that uh breeding was conservation. And as long as, you know, you're maintaining that, that um, clear species, you know, as Shauna mentioned that uh, breeding, you know, making sure you're not crossbreeding, that you're keeping to, to the genetic pool, then you're doing, you're actually doing a service. Um, you're doing a service mm -hmm. to the birds in the wall. It, it really so, is true. Now, there, and there, there yeah. are, I mean, this is the kind of topic that we could go into for um, for hours because it is very. Uh, there are lots of nuances uh, to to this as far as is is like breeding practice and stud books and genetic diversity and and all this sort of uh, the, all these technical conservation things that that we probably need to do more of. Um, because that's one reason, actually, that the Carolina parakeet died out um, is that in captivity, um, it died out in the wild for a bunch of other reasons that we're not here to discuss. Um, but in captivity, they didn't um, they didn't have the the right coordination between people that were captive raising them, and um, they they either their the genetic bottlenecks le led to lower productivity, or they didn't raise um, a, the, the the parents the the breeding pair would die, and the breeders didn't know to how to set up or where to get other birds to set up the pairs, and so the species was eventually lost. But so um, Nick, uh, I believe, just put up the slide that 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 dovetails into one reason that this is a good thing and it's about distribution of species I, I like to think of species of any kind whether that's a parrot or a person or a dog or a, a, a worm I like to think of them almost as just a facsimile of genetic information that you can describe through you know the four letters in DNA and um, as long as you have a copy of that information, you know something about that animal. And the, and, the, and the only way you can have it and have it to be perpetual is to keep it alive. Um, once it dies, that genetic information is lost. 
uh, it, we just have shadows and impre impressions like with fossils, dinosaurs and whatnot. We don't know as much as we could about them because that genetic information is lost. But so distribution in, in keeping that information around, distribution matters. So on that slide there, that's the total historical area that the Sun Conyers have ever lived. Um, <laughs> and go ahead, Robin, were you going to say something? No, I, that was a, that was a, hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. They've never like in the, in the entire universe in the wild, they've never lived anywhere, but in that yellow splotch and their current range is smaller than that. Um, I don't, we don't have a map of it, but if you wanted to, if, you know, if we were able to scroll the, the map down just a little bit, you'd find the Yucatan Peninsula, which was where the, uh, the asteroid that destroyed the dinosaurs landed and it's a ginormous crater. And if that asteroid tomorrow were to land uh, in that spot, it would take out just about the whole spot and all the, all of the sun conyers would be gone um, because that's where they live. And that, that, that's a problem. It's not anything that we did because that's the other thing. I think it's, it's really important in that a lot of times when you talk about species decline and species endangerment, um, people immediately go to, oh, it's our fault. Like, oh, you're, you know, okay, well, people are always bad because species are in decline. The only reason they're in decline or the only reason they're in danger is because of us. That's not necessarily true. Um, Let's um, let's pull up that next slide because I'm going to make this point here in in just a second the 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 one after that one. Uh, so we were talking about distribution. So again, so so you see, I'm sorry, I'm pointing at a screen that you can't see me pointing at. Um, but there, you see the Yucatan Peninsula up there. You see that sort of what was a ginormous crater. Let's say it landed on that X. That's where the Sun Conyers go. But today, if that were to happen, wouldn't be a big deal for the genetic information wouldn't be a big deal for the sun conure species because where all those green check marks are, are places that we know sun conures are being bred in captivity. So if it, you have a local event in that one spot, who cares? Because there's plenty of other birds around. And the reason they're around is because people like to keep them as pets. That's, that is why they are distributed in that way. It was simply because we like to have them around us. Um, and so, but, but so going to, so if you, so when you think about distribution and the isolation of populations, there are a lot of birds that are going, they're endangered because they're endangered and they will always be endangered because of where they live. Um, go ahead and roll over to the next, to the next slide there. Okay. Well, there we go. Um, I'm in, uh, yeah. So, uh, the Cape parrot, those two little blips on that map, that is their natural habitat. It's very small. Um, and you see Cape, Cape parrots are really neat birds. Oh my gosh. I, they're, they're so charismatic and so pretty and you have people keeping them as pets. But if it wasn't for that, that's the only place they live. And that's a very, very tiny place. So they, they probably would be enlisted as endangered whether we did anything to them or not, whether there were any problems in habitats or not, because that's where they are. Um, and go, there's one, the next one is even more germane because of what recently happened. Um, so that is the St. Vincent Amazon. And I have been saying for <clears throat> years now, as this, I've been using this bird as a prime example. Um, and by the way, this is one of my favorite birds of all time. Oh my gosh. I, I, we have some here in Houston and I go to the zoo and just gawk at them. Uh, it's, it's kind of disturbing if you see me do it actually. So, um, but anyway, these guys, they, so that purple dot on your screen there, that's where they live. That's where they've always lived. They've never lived anywhere else. That's the only place they have to live. And also St. Vincent is a volcanic island. And the volcano on St. Vincent just erupted. So it takes, and I'm sure a lot of birds died. 
and there have only ever been in the wild a few thousand of these birds because that's the only place they have to live. So they are endangered. They were always endangered because their numbers have always fit the the definition of what we call endangered, just simply because of where they are. And um, this is very difficult. It's uh, right. Uh, there are only a few breeding groups, I think, in the United States, and they're all institutional. I don't believe this bird. I don't think it's Jack. You can help me on this. I don't even think it's legal to have like you have to have a permit to breed this bird, right? Yeah, I, the the populations of this bird in the U.S. and around the world are very, very limited um, because they are so rare in captivity. Um, I'm not going to promise that nobody has one, but it is very, very unlikely because the genetic value of those birds. Um, so, yeah, at the Houston Zoo, uh, they actually have three breeding pairs of them. Um, and that is incredible. Um, and, you know, being able to raise them, um, you know, and, and that's why, they, so there are times where I just realized that some of the things that I have done, I am so incredibly fortunate and lucky to have gotten the opportunity to, I have gotten to work with these birds. I have had a juvenile St. Vincent Amazon sitting on a perch over my shoulder, preening my hair. Uh, it, it's it's incredible to think that there is uh, such a chance of these birds disappearing from the wild because in terms of beautiful parrots, you are going to be hard pressed to find a bird more stunning. If there is a color you can think of, it is on a St. Vincent's Amazon. And, yeah, you know, they're, they're gorgeous. It's that connection. You know, Danny talks about going to the zoo and, and being the creeper at the St. Vincent exhibit. Um, and, and that's okay. You know, I can tell you, you know, Jack talks about having one on his head, being able to hold a kakapo when I knew that there were only 128 of them in the world. But that's another example of a population that will probably always remain with the current status that it has because it's breeding is ridiculously inefficient. Um, it, you know, yes, there were some predators uh, introduced by humans, but regardless of that, they were still not the, you know, the most prolific bird. Um, and so some of those things we, we do, we beat ourselves up about some, you know, issues with populations and it's not always the case. The St. Vincent's what's going on right now, you know, and we just need to kind of bring that message out to people and really talk about they are so incredible. All of these creatures that we share our lives with and how do we, how do we make that, that connection happen? Not just for us as bird keepers, but for, you know, people out in the general public who don't have birds. So I, you know, I gotta agree with you on that, Danny. I, I, you know, I, it, and it, I, I lament the fact, cause what I, one of my things I would love to do is like, give, give me three pairs of those birds and let me give them to an experienced aviculturist, you know, and, and get them to start. I, I, I mean, I think, I think they could be, I think that could be so important. I don't know if we're ever going to get that opportunity. Um, but, but but that's the thing with aviculturists, aviculturists have spent their, their lives learning how to get birds to breed. Right. Uh, and, and, and so at a zoo, um, that's not necessarily their goal. Their goal is, is, is care and, and health and display and, and, and that sort of, but their goal is not, we got to get these things to have babies. And so I wish, oh my gosh, I wish we could get some into the hands of some professional aviculturists because I think it would be a big service to the species. So a, a couple of things on that. Um, one, I, as a former zoo professional, I'm going to have to lightly argue that point. Um, okay, and good. the only reason for that, I am going to let you know that if you go to a zoo 
the things that you see at a zoo are not all of the animals that they are working with at that facility. They are going to have off exhibit areas where they are working on breeding critically endangered animals. Um, so when I worked at the Houston Zoo, I got to interact with the parrots that we had off exhibit. Um, we had things like different reptiles. Um, the Houston Toad Conservation Project was based out of the Houston Zoo. So you see so many different things, or rather, you don't see so many different things, but they are still there. Um, so, you know, zoo zoos have the, they need to reach people so that they are aware of the things that are happening. Um, but they are definitely trying to aid in that conservation as well. Um, but the other thing, Danny, as you pointed out, I feel like a lot of times breeders of birds can be vilified because, oh, you're making more and more of these birds and, you know, no, we don't need them. There are plenty of birds that we could get from these other places. And the thing that, you know, people often forget is breeders are paying attention to the overall health and well-being of their birds because you want to keep healthy birds. They know how to breed these birds, which I can guarantee you, if you were ever in a situation where you had a catastrophic loss of part of the genetic diversity of that species, you want to know how to breed that species. You don't want to then waste time figuring it out because that time that you're figuring it out could also be time that, you know, some of the birds that you have left are naturally reaching the end of their lifespan or naturally reaching the end of their breeding lifespan. So the time that it takes to figure that out may not be time that we have with a species that's already threatened. I, I, I think, I think also, go, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to add to that, that, you know, with, with private aviculture, um, there are things that can be done in a smaller setting that may not be able to always be done in a, at a bigger facility. You know, if I've got a whole collection of birds that I'm needing to care for versus a private aviculturist that's working with a slightly smaller collection. As Jack mentioned, it may be they can figure out how that works and, and, you know, what's the best way to get that done. And it's through, you know, private avic, well, it's a state run aviculture, but um, in with the, with the Kakapo, um, the, the numbers, you know, are, have increased because of that dedication to aviculture. And I think the, those kind of things, and people are mentioning, you know, San Diego Zoo, they have the Avian Propagation Center. There are so many different places, the, the California Condor. Where would the California Condor be without, you know, the, the facilities like that that are working on it? But also I know that there are private aviculturists um, who are permitted obviously, but who are working on things like condor conservation. And it's, it's with, um, you know, with that in mind that we, we talk about how do we help with the conservation as someone who's not, you know, in C2 out in the wild. Well, I, I think it, it's uh, in a lot of that can be helped um, where I think pet owners and private uh, aviculturists um, are, well, anybody who's paying attention can do this, but um so if you want to talk about studies in the wild, um, parrot, parrot science is hard uh, out, in the, out in the wild. I mean, ask somebody like Don Brightsmith, who is climbing billion meter tall trees to go look in scarlet macaw nests and, uh, and, and whatnot. And the other, and, and a lot of, there's a lot of work that hasn't been done on parrots because they're, they can fly and we can't, and it is hard to observe them. Um, and, um, it is hard to, to keep up with them. And, um, it, so you and your house, this is where you serve a purpose because you have the opportunity. I have the opportunity with my birds to be in a situation with them where I'm co I'm interacting with them and I'm observing them hours at hours a day. And so I'm going to, I have a bird here that's not flying off. That is not, um, that, that is, it is not hidden in the canopy. That's with me. 
and I can just watch this bird and make observations. Now, I will be the first to admit that yes, a bird probably behaves slightly different um, in your presence than maybe it would in a wild flock. But nonetheless, you still get to observe that bird and you get to make notes and you get to see things and you get to perhaps see things that a researcher might not because they can't get to them. You get to see that, you know, when my bird is on my hand, it's less than a foot away from my face. And um, you, how you how often is that possible in a bird that's up in the canopy? And, and so we have uh, an ability to make novel observations about their behavior and about how they work, how their, their, their mechanics of their body in ways that it's very difficult to do in the wild. And I, I understand that anytime you're observing in captivity, um, you, that comes with a caveat that it, that may not necessarily be a behavior or an action that happens in the wild, but we have learned a lot. I've learned a lot about birds just from watching my own animals and just really being careful about, about observing and, and letting them be as birds as they can be with, you know, in our presence, but really interesting and fascinating things that you can learn about how they work, about their body mechanics, um, about their own individual quirks the, of, of the species as comparing one to another. Because I also have a gold capped conure, which is in the same complex as the sun conure. And they're very different birds, even though they're very similar. And you get to see all that. So we are ideally um, placed in some ways to make observations that other people can't. Uh, and you and you need to write the you know you need to record that stuff. So absolutely. So we don't have somebody with a sad picture of you at some point in time <laughs> saying. And Daniel Sigman had a son Conyer, and he didn't feel like he needed to write it down. And so it's true. We've got that's part of our responsibility. And I just want to back up um, for one second. Shauna um, brought up a point about responsible breeding in the chat. And Shauna, I just want to say. When we talk about breeding, um, it's responsible breeding that we're talking about. It's not about, you know, the, the, you know, breed and just get it out there. It's when we're talking about breeding for conservation and in responsible breeding in general, it's people who are doing it right and people who have done their research um, and who really know that they have a responsibility as breeders of these beautiful creatures. And they also have a responsibility to educate. And then we have a responsibility to educate once they get into, you know, individual hands. So I think, you know, I just want, I didn't want to let that go by because it is important that you do your research and, and anything about getting a bird, you've got to do that research um, and make sure that you know what you're getting into, know where you're getting it from um, and, and really be diligent about that. So thank you know thank you Shauna for bringing that up I appreciate that. Well and on the on the same line of thinking as that um you know when we mention going to zoos visiting zoos um you know I like to promote people going to zoos because it is one of those things that actually can benefit conservation just by you going to the zoo. A lot of zoos have programs where a portion of their admissions is going to go towards different conservation projects. Um in this instance, we're going to be talking about things like AZA accredited zoos. That's going to be the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Um, we are talking about zoos that are doing that work. Not every roadside attraction that attaches the name zoo to the end of their name um, is necessarily what we're going to be talking about in this situation. We, you know, like Robin said with breeders, we are talking about that responsible breeder. Um, we're talking about responsible zoos. Um, so, but I, I agree with all of these, it is important for you to do your research, to know that you are working with one that is responsible. Well, and I, as far as like, as far as breeders, um, and, and breeding, um, I think it is, it's, it, it, it is, it's never a service to anyone. If you have someone who is breeding without a knowledge of, bloodline, genetic diversity. Um, if it, you, you have to take, if, if your goal, if our goal is to keep these animals as healthy as possible, the, the greater extent that we can cooperate 
with each other to create, to sustain those, uh, to, to keep the genetic diversity as, 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 as free as it can be. Uh, that's the ultimate goal, I think, uh, where we're doing this. There are certain factors in the universe right now which prevent that. One of them, ironically, is the Endangered Species Act um, because uh, the way it's currently administered, um, if a bird uh, is declared endangered on the on the United States Endangered Species Act, uh, there are all these, you know, trans uh, trans or in, intrastate, interstate uh, distinctions that have to be made. And uh, you can't take birds across state lines and these things. None of that serves those birds in any way where they're from because they don't live here naturally. And so all you've done is you have hampered the efforts of the, you've hampered the efforts of the people who are working with the birds to keep genetic diversity what you've all, all of a sudden what you've done is t is created 50 isolated populations because you have all these birds that are now isolated in the states and right. if you need to pull genetic information from another state you can't do it you know so uh, ultimately we need to have a system uh where breeders are encouraged and and are keeping track of that kind of information and that's that's that will serve the birds best i think I, I absolutely agree. And I think um, before we want to talk about how to make that connection, what we can do, but Danny, what about the Puerto Rican Amazon? Oh, um, yeah. So uh, um, I think you, you both also know Hafet and Ricardo uh, very well. They're so, such lovely people. Uh, they work, they, it's a, uh, um, uh, Hafet uh, Velez and and uh, Ricardo Valentin, uh, that are uh, the people that run the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Puerto Rican Amazon program, uh, the Puerto Rican Parrot Project, I think is what they call it. Um, they so so the, that's another example of a bird that is always going to be endangered because it's the Puerto Rican Amazon. Now. Puerto Rico is not as small as St. Vincent, but it's still a small place and it's the only place where it lives. Um, and uh, so, so this is an example of, it's not private aviculture, but it is a, an example of aviculture from a state perspective where they've hired people uh, to repopulate the species and they've done an amazing job. Just a few years ago, uh, the perfect example of why this needs to take place we, happened when uh, was it Hurricane Maria mm -hmm. uh, went through Puerto Rico, and um, so they had the forethought years ago that they need to have two centers for these birds just in case. And sure enough, this this was a terrible hurricane, and it went through and just mowed down Puerto Rico, and they lost almost all the birds on one side of the island yeah. but the project has continued to prosper and the, the the population has recovered very quickly because they had the population on the other side of the island um mm -hmm. and they've done a really good job of 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 bringing this bird back from the brink and are doing all kinds of wonderful wild release soft release programs uh but, oh, it's an amazing program and they, they should be congratulated for that. Absolutely. I, I had the opportunity, oh, probably seven years ago to visit um, Ricardo's uh, uh, site and just the work they're doing there is amazing. The, you know, the cages hanging out in the, the rainforest for soft release are just so well thought out and it, and it's just it's an incredible program. And we've also done work as a company. The Leather Elves has done work with a company um, and with Hafet's program. Um, and it's it's been really fun to see what they're doing for enrichment with those birds, um, you know, and how they're they're trying to keep it as natural as possible because they are, you know, working on the native population, but they're also providing things that they're, they may not have access to. 
And I know it's been a lot of work for them to recover from that hurricane situation. So yeah, both of those gentlemen are wonderful and they do such great work. Um, and, you know, I think it's things like that, that we can do, you know, we can support those kind of programs by going to visit those programs. We can, uh, you know, the ones that are open to the public, we can, you know, if we're, when we're able to travel, like, see, I'm all cocky now because I had my second vaccine today. Um, but, two weeks. you know, when we're, when we're able to go, you know, those are the kind of things we can do. The other thing we can do is to help expose the general public to our love of birds. You know, Jack, do you, what do you think? I mean, I, how okay. do we? So again, go to the zoo. Um, that, is, that is a great opportunity. Take your friends to the zoo. Um, a couple of years ago, I got talked into uh, helping a friend of mine that was doing a competition in another state. I said, okay, that's fine. I will go with you. You do not have to pay me, but we are going to go to, uh, it was in St. Louis, so I wanted to go to the St. Louis Zoo. We're walking through the birdhouse. Somehow or other, I don't know how this happened because I haven't met me and I'm not familiar with my personality. Uh, somehow or other, I end up giving this impromptu tour in the birdhouse where I am explaining to the, at first it was the three people that I was with. Um, but at one point I had about 11 people following me as I am explaining the sexual dimorphism of this species of hornbill and the diet of, uh, you know, the Sariyama and all of these fun things that I have picked up in my professional experience with these birds. And all of those people were getting to benefit from it. So share your love of aviculture, of birds with everyone else. I mean, I can tell you right now, having gone to places for lunch with Danny, they will ask Danny, what would you like to drink? And he'll say, oh, you know, I'd like a Diet Coke. And can I tell you about the Carolina parakeet? Um, so, <laughs> you know, use your openings, but by having birds in our homes, we have this unique passion for them, these experiences for them, which do open the door for other people to care about them as well. And, and I think too, one of the things we've got to keep in mind is, so in our circle, we all know that we're the crazy bird people, right? We've got bird nerds like Danny. We've got, you know, crazy people just in general like Jack. Um, and then, you know, we've got the average crazy person like me. And I think we need to make sure that when we're out there and we're sharing our passion, that we are professional, that we are our birds. In, the second you take your bird out the door, in that carrier, in that cage, in that backpack, in that, on that harness, the second you go out the door and somebody sees you that doesn't have a pet parrot, they are going, you suddenly become a superhero. Okay. You, you have a bird and your, the immediate response is to go, I do. And it's pretty cool. But along with that, slip in a little education, you know, don't be the crazy parrot person, be the person that comes out there and do, Demi does outreach. I know Diane does outreach. A lot of you who are Adrian, a lot of you who are on right now do that outreach piece and you've got to do it from, you've got to let the passion come out, but you've got to be professional if at the same time. OK, and when you're online, so when you're talking to other bird people, we've got to make sure we put the keyboard warriors aside and that we really work with one another. Yeah, Melissa, is it real? Is that bird real? You know, you want to go, of course it is. It's cool. It lives with me. But we've, you've got to you've you've got to work as a community. Right? We, yeah. Um, you know, Robin and I have talked on various topics and a lot of times we come back to the same idea of playing the game of worst case scenario 
Um, so whenever you're setting up enrichment, if you're putting together a new cage, um, making sure that it is safe because you have already thought of what is the worst thing that could happen. When you are presenting yourself with your bird, it's almost like you need to do the same thing. What is the worst way that, you know, things you are putting out there, if you're putting out photos, if you're putting out videos, if you're not interacting with your bird appropriately, or if you're interacting with your bird in a way that is, um, you know, highly subjective, open to criticism, um, are people going to see you and think, this is a passionate person who cares immensely about this species and is working very hard to know more about this species and to promote them in captivity? Or are they going to look at you and think, this is a crazy bird person? Um, and, you know, we, we may call ourselves crazy bird people, but, you know, I think the only way we are going to make aviculture our birds more accessible to people is by just thinking of that worst case scenario. Think about how you are presenting yourself, presenting your bird. Uh, I mean, Danny, what do you think? Oh yeah, I think it's it's I think it's really important uh, that that when you're in public uh, that you comport yourself uh, properly and and with distinction for for birds and bird keeping and and that your birds are um in uh you know well cared for the pictures that you share make sure they're appropriate like, i mean like um i know i've seen pictures of like people with like uh like you know over a pot of stew with their bird like right here and i'm like oh gosh that's cute but seriously oh god that's a disaster waiting to happen. actually i know a friend who actually boiled a parakeet that way uh you know so you know yeah you need to yeah you should definitely make sure that you're setting a good example um with with your own birds and also um you know <laughs> Also, maybe not being the annoying bird guy either, you know, so it's like, oh, God, here comes again, more bird stuff. I don't care, you know, uh, you know, so but yes, I, I do. And I also want to make sure that I say, since this is um, a national platform and uh, will live in perpetuity, that lest anyone get the idea um, that I am sort of that I'm an anti zoo person. That is absolutely not the case. I have great admiration for what for what zoos do. I think the the the, the context of the comment that I made was that zoos have an enormous burden and responsibility that goes beyond simply making more birds. Uh, mm -hmm. And that that's that's where I'm coming from. It's like that. Uh, they have an enormous job that the, of which only a small part is that that piece so um yeah well, and it, it's you know it's true and we when we all get together and and it's everybody's talking about birds and everybody's excited it's so nice to see that commonality that we share and i think you know in the back of our heads somewhere is and that conservation piece you know, that's that's the piece that comes after, you know, we talk about the cool birds. But I think we really need to focus a lot more of our attention on that and a lot more of our attention on being that person who's out there, um, you know, presenting themselves and presenting their birds. We want people to want birds, right? We want people yeah. to want birds that are bred responsibly. You know, and and we want them to know what work they are too, Danny. Yeah, no, I, I and you definitely what work. Yeah, even if it takes even yeah, even if it that work takes uh, ten years away from your start date. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I think so. Uh, we, I think, you know, there is a there is a sort of a tension because yeah, there, the, you know, on the one side, you have your pet birds. And if they're eyes there, that makes them one, an isolated population two, probably not a breeding population. So there are going to be some that say, oh, you know, look, it's a wasted, it's a wasted animal because it, it will never be able to reproduce and whatever. But by purchasing that bird from someone, you have encouraged someone who is concerned with perpetuating the species. And, um, 
And, and, and so when I look at my birds, when I'm sitting with my birds, I'm thinking I'm participating in conservation. This bird is conservation. Um, and if I could do more, I would. Um, uh, and one day perhaps I will, you know, because I'm, I'm, so I'll give you just an example of, uh, I have a gold capped conure, which um, those are increasingly rare in captivity. And um, so for a long time, I, I was sort of felt really guilty. Like I've got to pair up this bird because uh, we've got, I've got to make more of these, but it turns out he's a male. And if you're doing population studies, males don't count. So I feel okay. Uh, and that's, that's true. It's true. When you're doing population st uh, studies in the wild, it's the, the females that you're really worried about because they're the only ones that can make new ones. So, uh, but, you know, uh, yeah, but I do think uh, that it's important for you, for everybody to see themselves as playing a role in that conservation, whether as an ambassador, as an amateur observer, um, and if nothing else, as a, as a financial supporter. Um, because one thing I think people f are, in, are, are um, well, they're just not aware of is the fact that at, when you can, if you take a, a pie uh, that is a research money's pie, how little of that pie is actually spent on avian research. Um, and, and the truth of it is, it's just because alien the, uh, the birds are alien weirdos and they don't have much commonality with us. And if you study a mammal, odds are you might, you might find out something that, that is good for us too. Whereas with a bird, it's probably not going to, not going to, you know, like with a medication, it's probably not going to react the same way uh, in a bird as it would in a human because it's not a mammal. Um, so support research support, you know, they, they always are in need of money. Um, the, support, uh, you know, avian clubs and organizations because that's the, those folks are, are, are working to try to bring, um, a greater, um, a greater, per, a greater sort of, um, shape to all this. Um, I, you know, I'm, I said before I was a composer and, um, uh, the software that I used to write music used to have a tagline. Um, it's changed now, but anyway, it was perfecting the art of music notation. And I think a lot of these organizations, aviculture is not perfect. Um, re avian research is not perfect, but through these organizations, we are perfecting aviculture. We are perfecting avian research with zoos you're we're perfecting the 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 conservation and the relevance the relevant keeping of of animals because it's those organizations that that bring these animals to the front i mean i've even i'm i'm like a i'm a big pro sea world person too um because there is no better ambassador for the wild than one of those. I, the last time I was at SeaWorld, and I know it's because of black blackfish. It's it's a it's like really non PC. You're supposed to hate SeaWorld, and keeping orcas is demon spawn activity. But um, I I know people thought I was absolutely insane, but I, I we came late, and so there's really no seating to that particular show. And I just sort of stood up at the top of the bleachers. And by the end of the show, I was weeping because I was so overwhelmed with the amazingness of those animals. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so our parrots serve that same role, just like you were talking about. We had I used to have a, a, a blue and gold macaw who would sit here. That's why I made that gesture. Uh, a blue, uh, and um, he he's passed away now, and sadly he was old and 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 a rescue. Um, but he he had an injury that, that that wouldn't allow him to fly, so we took him everywhere. Uh, we we when we'd go walking and things, we'd just take him with us. And people were gobsmacked when they would see us, you know, walking past. And I think our all of us. Uh, end up being those kind of ambassadors 
um, for our birds and and with our birds. Well, and, and Danny, I, with all that right now, there's actually a couple of other things that you brought up that we wanted to mention as well, other ways that people can assist with that conservation. First of all, you had talked about the observations that you make on your birds. You get to see them on a regular basis. You get information that researchers do not get. I guarantee you there are researchers that if you have a sun conure in your house and there's somebody studying sun conures, if you can get a weekly weight on that bird, that is information that that researcher would kill for. And just doing it on one bird isn't as useful as everybody getting that information. And then we get that average. So even if you just have pet birds, if you're not breeding them, if if they are not currently um, any kind of endangered, threatened, um, if they're not currently in decline, which, I mean, we already talked about more than half a parrot species currently have populations in decline, they could be at some point. Um, it's always important to remember that people did not think that the Carolina parakeet was going to go away, and it did. So the, that information, your experiences with those birds are critically important. Um, you also mentioned organizations that people can utilize. And that is a great source of information for reaching out and interacting with conservation programs. And uh, here, Robin, I'll go ahead and ask you, since you have uh, been on the board of directors of most of these, uh, do you have any avian organizations you would like to recommend as sources for people? There are so many, there, well, there are some great ones out there. There's the American Federation of Aviculture. Um, and, you know, we talk about, we're all conservationists. Um, anyone who has a bird is a conservationist. We're also aviculturists. Anyone who keeps a bird is an aviculturist. Um, so there's the American Federation of Aviculture, um, NPRPF, which is near and dear to all three of our hearts. Um, and the, you, you can, Go to Parrot Festival, and I expect to see all of you at the next Parrot Festival we have live. Um, and you could the International Association of Avian Trainers and Educators. They also do conservation grants, and they work on a lot of conservation programs. And we could, you can just, if you go through those organizations, they'll give you other suggestions. I noticed Dorothy Patterson was on tonight. Um, Dorothy, you know, works on an amazing project for the blue throat and macaw. So, you know, people, you know, you, they may be working on conservation projects and you don't even know it. You know, Danny mentioned, uh, uh, Don, Dr. Brightsmith, Don Brightsmith has an incredible conservation project. There are so many, um, out there and you just pick your passion and go with it, you know, and get out there and show off your birds and, don't show people the, your bird bites. That's not what we want to show them. We want to show them how the, the feathering and the colors and the intelligence, those, that's the message we want to get across. And that's what will encourage people to support conservation um, for these birds. So, Danny, any final words before we ask our trivia question for the night? Uh, just... Um, just be know that you can be a part of it. You can be a part of this. Um, and and I think Jack mentioned, like he said, what of the weight? Like, like keep a running at running total or average or even better a chart with the weights of your bird. So that seems like s such boring information, right? Like nobody would care. But actually, it's tremendously important. I. I, I um, I'll, I'll give this one final anecdote that just, and, and this comes from my own avian vet in conversations with them. If you have a cat or a dog, they, you can go and, and, and they'll be like, oh, well, you know, your dog is, something's wrong with your dog because your dog is outside of this weight range or is some other data point that is irregular. And they know that because they have detailed information about that dog, about dogs in general general it depending on the species of your bird they might not know because they don't have that information it does not exist so if you're keeping a weekly chart of your cape parrot's weight 
and you do it for 20 years, by God, somebody is going to want to see that because it would be super useful information. So um, you can be just a guy, just a gal, and you can make tremendous um, contributions in this field. Danny, I know Danny had one more slide that we didn't see. Oh. Um, and I think it's kind of pertinent. I think we need to take a look at that. If you've got it there, Nick, that would be great. So, so Danny. Yeah. So, so, um, it, so I talked about, uh, it's one thing we didn't talk about is one of the, one of the things that people say is that they use to deride captive breeding is that it causes genetic changes in the animals over time. And, um, but I'm, I say, okay, so fine. It does. But the picture of the bird on the left playing with that bird toy, maybe it's not a 100% genetically, um, uh, similar animal to its wild counterparts, but that is so much better than what's on the right, which is a, tray of Carolina Conyers that have been stuffed and are sitting in a, a natural history museum somewhere that, and they're gone forever. So I'd much rather have what's on the left than what's on the right. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Danny. Um, we, again, so I, if anybody out there still thinks Danny's just a guy, Mm, I don't know. I might, I might have to fight you on that one because Danny is so much more than just a guy. But uh, we, we really appreciate you bringing all this, you know, to the live stream tonight. But we've got a trivia question. Jack, do you do you want to read the trivia question? Sure, I can go ahead and read our trivia question. So our trivia. <laughs> What is the closest living relative of the Carolina parakeet? Um, so we do have Danny, a couple. You can't of, answer. This. Okay, fine. Yeah, Danny, Danny can't answer this. Um, we do have a couple of answers we are willing to accept, and I will point out that even though Danny said it earlier, we are not willing to accept Carolina parakeet as the <laughs> answer to the closest <laughs> living relative of the Carolina parakeet. I am. I'm curious to find out if they get if you get both of the answers. I'm expecting you to get as correct answers because you're right. There are two. There are two that could go. Lori McFarlane, a son Conyer. Good job, Lori. <clears throat> so, Lori, I know that Lori has already registered for um, the Bets Conference. And tonight's trivia prize was additional materials in your workshop materials kit for the conference. So we're going to put some extra. Lori's even coming up with like the, the Latin name. I'm really impressed. Um, but we're going to put some extra materials in Lori's kit. Um, so congratulations. If you haven't registered, I really, really want to encourage you guys to consider registering. It's Friday night fun and some happy hour stuff so that we, you know, can get together and just kind of and bird nerd with one another. And then Saturday and Sunday are two full days of um, some great presentations and hands on workshops. And so, but you've got to register by the end of May. Um, because we can't get you out the materials um, if you don't. So if you want the materials to, to participate in those hands-on workshop, we've got to get your registration before that. Um, and I also I will tell you there's some um, surprise goodies too. So yeah, surprise goodies. Who doesn't love surprise goodies? So yeah, sign up and um, we're going to have some fun. Jack? Yeah. The, so the other thing, so we've been talking about aviculture and avian conservation. One thing that we really want to point out about this conference, Robin and I agreed on this wholeheartedly. We knew this was something we wanted to do. A portion of the proceeds from this conference will be going to the Georgia Fletcher Memorial Scholarship. Uh, now that is a scholarship set up in the name of uh, actually, all three of our friends, 
um, Georgia Fletcher. It is a scholarship benefiting veterinary students uh, studying aviculture. So it is something that we are immensely happy to be able to support. Um, you know, Georgia, if you did not know her, was so incredibly passionate about aviculture. The education of new people coming in to aviculture. Um, as I, I first met her one of the first years that I went to Parrot Festival, and okay, this is going to sound like a bit of a pun, but she had no problem taking people under her wing and, you know, trying to inspire that passion in them. So for Robin and I both, it was so important that we help to support that. Um, so please know if you are registering for the Place Your Bets conference, not only are you getting all of the wonderful benefits we've talked about before, speakers from all over the world, uh, hand, multiple hands-on workshops. We are even providing uh, the materials for one of the workshops. You'll get those in the mail. You get the happy hour. But you also are doing your part to help the future of aviculture. This is, again, just like going to the zoo, just like some of the other things we talked about. This is something fun you can do that still does its part to help. So we definitely encourage you guys to check it out. All righty. So again, thank you so much, Danny. Um, we have really appreciated um, having you tonight. It's it's been it's been fun. You're my kind of guy. <laughs> Just. <laughs> 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 All right, everybody. Good night. I wait, hope wait, wait, you... wait, wait. So next wait, week, wait, wait, wait. next oh. week, we got to make sure everybody knows. Um, because that's great. This is something that we have seen a lot. So for next week's topic, we are going to be covering the issue of parrot hormones. Um, we want to take a really close look at that and realize that it's a reality and not an excuse. Um, so if you have experienced that with your own birds, please tune in. If you know people who have experienced it with their birds, encourage them to tune in. Um, if you have a neighbor you kind of like, and you want to get them into birds, get them to tune in as well. Because remember, if we can hit our goal of having 50 plus viewers at any given time during the live stream, we're going to be doing another giveaway in addition to these that we normally do, but we always do a trivia question and a giveaway every single week. And I have to admit that um, if you want to see my hair continue to stay in my head, you guys will come next week and listen, because if I read one more time, my bird is hormonal and I don't know what to do on Facebook. It, it's going away. It's getting thinner and thinner. So you've got to be here next Friday night. And uh, gone, again, thank you so much. You're what? I've gone gray. <laughs> it's true. You know, and, and so we want to address that. So parrot hormones, a reality, not an excuse next Friday night. And uh, we will see you all have a wonderful week. Thanks again, Danny. And you all take care. Good night.